Welcome on the Late Night Live. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your host, Adnan Maksud, all the way from Albany, New York. Excited to come on this broadcast because I've been pondering on this question and I've been uh, thinking, bringing my special guest on this broadcast as Greg gonna share on his Facebook. So um, I'm gonna have him come on and uh, we've been talking for a long time and this is the gentleman that got me tapped into uh, you know, reading and studying and also look at, uh, even though I was very interesting in traveling and very interested in, you know, traveling, try different foods, get to know different people. But when I met him, you know, he actually given me a new perspective. So I'm very proud and very good to know what I know today. And um, today we're going to talk amazing topic. I don't know if anybody spoke about it yet. It is not a political discussion. It's not bashing a country. It's not about uh, plotting or it's not a conspiracy theory or anything. It is simple conversation from observation and also trying to see um, by the uh, metrics or methods or things, how things are happening in the world right now and uh, what significant role China is playing. So. My friend, he is going to share. Is it's not a political commentator, or or he's not as some conspiracy theorist. Um, he's a gentleman, Christian man of God, and a very good uh, person. So um, I'm gonna bring him on. So here, my friend, all the way from Oklahoma, with me on this broadcast, uh, Greg Nasbet. Although he look like a, a government official, but he's not. <laughs> But he may be one day. Uh, so hey, how are you, Greg? How are you, sir? Good. How are you? I am doing good. Man, um, I am just putting that disclaimer out there so people understand this is not a conversation to 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 get somebody mad or or we are not developing any conspiracy theory or something like that. It's just a simple discussion that over the time that you study, uh, you know, about China and uh, other countries too, not just China, uh, but you have observed over the time how the, ch and you read about like how China transformed over time and how China is playing a very key role in a global economy. So right. that your interest for, for China comes from your studying in the college. So here over to you, when did you discover first of all that you're learning China. And <laughs> also when you thought about it and what motivated you to study China? Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, Pastor Adnan. It's great to be here. Um, I was trained first as a minister and my work of the ministry began with Native America. And the, the pastors who trained me were Native American. And uh, shortly, I don't know, about five years into to working there, we went to the Philippines. Yep. And not long after that, uh, it was big news around, I think, 2016 when uh, uh, Rodrigo Duterte was elected president of the Phil Philippines and he began his war on drugs and a lot of people were killed. And President Obama spoke up against this and uh, mm -hmm. Rodrigo Duterte got everyone's attention by basically saying he was shifting the allegiance of the Philippines from the United States to Russia and China. Uh, that was really my first exposure, uh, my first time to really give thought to China. I didn't know any of the nuance about uh, East Asia or uh, anything, really. I, I was just a guy who was going to preach the gospel. And this was very fascinating uh, while I was there. And Shortly after that, the Lord began to lead me to other countries, and I began to see that China is very active in other countries. And so I just became curious, and I began studying. Uh, and for people who don't know yet what we're talking about, yeah. um, there is a professor at Harvard University named Graham Allison who coined the phrase Thucydides Trap. Thucydides was a, Pelopene uh, was a general in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, long ago, and he made this observation. It was the rise of Athens and the fear this created in Sparta that made war inevitable. And he began to observe uh, cases where uh, a rising power began to encroach upon a ruling power. And 
he identified 16 times that this happened in the last 500 years and 12 of them led to war. Mm. And so he began to kind of sound the alarm and say that China's rise makes war more likely with the United States than not likely. And so if we're going to avoid that catastrophe as China's rise continues, then we're going to have to start thinking about what things we're willing to sacrifice, what compromises we're willing to make. Because the basic uh, pattern is that one country passes another economically. And if that country is already like the big dog of their environment, you know, in, in international affairs, we call the United States the hegemon. Uh, it's the dominant country of the world. Um, when, when a country begins to challenge the hegemon, uh, step one is usually first they become more uh, powerful economically, then their military spending, uh, they outspend militarily the other country. And then over time, it's just a matter of time if they're outspending the other country militarily that they begin to uh, challenge some of the established world order. So we already see this happening. And this is something that concerns me for the sake of my children and their future, um, because I don't think China's growth is going to slow down. And so we need to start being strategic as a country. We need to start um, making more people aware of this so that we can have a sober, rational response instead of a temper tantrum whenever we begin to no longer be the ruling power in the world. Yeah, so um, as we were talking, we have talked numerous times uh, on that, and you're the very first person that got me, you know, man, you first of all gave me a book of uh, all the shots, man, I started reading, you know, and then you gave me a book on China. So no matter what you gave me, you know, and... I didn't like, hey, Greg gave me a book. I'm not interested in that. But as I'm a new book reader, very interested um, about learning different. It, it really opened up my mind, you know, because I, from the time I got saved, I've been very actively in ministry and preaching and teaching. And uh, I have also traveled a few countries. But when you, you know, given me uh, material to read, that's really open up my perspective, not in a negative way, but in a positive way that what I was missing for a long time. And you also emphasize that last night when you talk about China, people think that you're a Trump supporter. And not just only that, we just want to upset one or another. But, but what I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to make any comments later on people or upset anybody. I'm glad you anticipated that. <laughs> That's good. And that's a very neutral conversation, um, you know, going to have. And um, when you think about China, because I think the very first president that brought China into a conversation, it was a Trump because uh, he talked about China, he talked about Japan, and he talked about South Korea, that they are ripping us off, you know? Right. And uh, and that's that was very, very, very first of my introduction to China because being from Pakistan, born and raised there, Everything in Pakistan, uh, you know, Chinese cell phones and made in China. So we are used to it. But coming to America, I never knew that, you know, I'm also going to see made in. But here, even more, I see made in China. So and then when President Trump started talking about China and when you gave me that book, it just blew up my mind. You know, it's just like right. it's blew, blew up my mind. So we are often talk about not to. Uh, talk about China, but first of all, tell me what is the meaning of China and tell me a little bit of China history. What what do you know from your observation and study? Yeah, so first of all, full disclaimer, I've, uh, I've taken one graduate level class at Johns Hopkins on East Asian security, and that's where most of my familiarity with this topic comes. There are other people who are far more experienced and know far more than I do, but I can basically tell the, the very simplest of basics. Um, the word China literally means middle kingdom. Mm. And it doesn't mean middle in the sense that it's uh, the land that's surrounded by other places. It, they mean middle kingdom in the sense that it is the, the kingdom that is between heaven and earth. Uh, like superior kingdom is essentially what that means. And there, there's thousands of years to cover uh, regarding Chinese history, but um, from about 1850 to even present still, it's not completely restored. They refer to this time as um, uh, 
Oh, it's slipping my mind now. <laughs> the century of shame, century of humiliation. And that's because their historic lands, some of them were taken. Um, and they've been trying to recover those over the years. So Hong Kong, uh, I think around 2000, went from British rule to uh, Chinese Communist Party rule. Uh, I didn't know this until I started studying China, that Taiwan uh, was actually the result of a uh, civil war between China within China's mainland. And those who wanted democracy fled to Taiwan. So both countries still claim to be the official Chinese government, uh, but they have what they call the, the one country, two systems policy. So Taiwan is democratic. China is communist. Um, until sometime in the early 70s, the United States recognized Taiwan as the official Chinese uh, country and government. And it was in the Nixon administration that he accepted an invitation to, to go meet with the leaders of China. And ever since then, the United States has recognized the Chinese Communist Party. Um, it was believed that if the United States would help China become a more, I'm talking mainland China, if we were to help China become a economically prosperous country, that they would in turn become a democratic country because that's usually the correlation you see in countries throughout the world. Uh, in fact, what we've done is we've made them a more powerful uh, communist country. Can you give an example? Like you said, more countries like, um, what, what, what are those countries that became democratic when prosperity came? Um, I, I don't know any examples. It's just, I don't even know that it's a, a cause and effect necessarily. It's just a correlation that they see that communist countries tend to be poor and uh, democratic countries tend to be prosperous. And China is very pragmatic. So they were the first that I know of communist country to say, we don't have to live by Karl Marx by the, by the letter. Sorry, so was, can we call it um, Vietnam? Communist from communist or democratic? No, Vietnam is still communist at this time. Okay. Um, so North or North, both? It's one country now and it's all communist. Gotcha. Um, but, um, oh, I lost my train of thought, Adnan, sorry. Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I'm learning, oh, man. Oh, so China is very pragmatic and they're the first that I know of country that kind of abandoned Karl Marx's concept of communism and replaced it with what they call communism with Chinese characteristics. So it became the case that people could own businesses and people could prosper economically and instead of having to give all of your surplus and just live off of a monthly stipend like you see in many other communist countries. Now you have men like Jack Ma uh, who are multimillionaires, billionaires, you know, and it, they basically recognize that the Cold War was lost, uh, not to military means, but through economic means. And so they concluded that communism is not necessarily the best uh, economic structure, but they still retain it as their political structure. So there's still no freedom of speech in China. Uh, there's still no freedom of religion. Um, you can't dissent with the government that's seen as problematic. Um, and I gotta be careful what I say because I wanna represent China as someone from China would speak about it. They would say, oh, there's freedom of speech here. You're, you're speaking evil of us. Um, but as we understand universal rights in the United States, that is not uh, the rule of law in China. It's multiple societies you know so imagine if all 50 states had different forms of government and the the federal government tried to honor all of them instead of having one practice all over the country um so that is how china governs and so it's a, a big fear of the chinese communist party that there could be uh civil unrest from within and so they work very hard to shut down dissent and shut down um, anything that could lead to conflict within the country. Wow, that is that is um, very interesting. So um, coming to the point, that's that's a very good that you have shared the history. That's really good for uh, those that who have a zero understanding of China, except for only um, you know that everything is made in China over trade. <laughs> uh, America trade big with China, you know, and. Uh, Billions of dollars are being spent over years and even trillions of dollars and and uh, how China came from the back end to the forefront 
of so many countries now having bases in so many other countries. It really um, make me think about China as going forward. What would Christian China would look like? You know, what would Christian yes. China would look like? So that's a beautiful question, and we we talked about this last night. Yeah. There's a couple ways I can answer that. What would an authentic Christian China look like, and what would Christian China look like? Yeah. When when I think about the fact that the United States was a Christian country when we supported slavery, when I think about the fact that the United States was a Christian country when we killed hundreds of thousands of people in the Philippines uh, in a war of conquest, essentially, um, what I'm trying to say is that being a Christian com country doesn't necessarily mean that a country doesn't practice uh, what we would call sinful policies. And so it's possible that it could be no different. Um, but if we're talking about an authentically Christian China, um, then it's, I think it's likely that there would be world peace. And uh, what we see right now throughout the world is that China is practicing development. And the way that they're uh, developing other countries is in their economic best interest. And what people in Washington are really beginning to fear is whether these economic best interests are a prelude to military best interests. Uh, so there's what's called the One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, where there's or the Belt and Road initiative, where they're setting up uh, all kinds of infrastructure all throughout Asia, Africa, and all the way to Europe to try to make trade something that happens more easily. Uh, but people in Washington are beginning to fear, is this something that will lead to them setting up an empire, essentially? And so I think I'll, I'll phrase it this way. If China does what is right and does not try to harm people, then I think it could be great for the world uh, that they're setting up so much infrastructure and that they're helping with so much development in other countries. On the other hand, if what we're seeing is China trying to set up its empire, then it could be terrible for all of us in the future. Yeah, because um, it's not just a large country, but it carries a great influence and an influence with... Um, economic influence and uh, influence of being you know lending money to other countries and um that's also great influence and also wants to play a very significant leadership role so what do you think uh, right so that's the question question uh, china but let's talk about do you think that if what what leader china will look like you know you talk about setting empire but economically and uh, do you think china and us will go good together as being the two world leaders or one world leader i honestly fear the united states response more than i fear china um when i look at how um how can i put that some of these populist responses that we've seen in the last four years my greatest fear is what will happen when white nationalists begin to understand how much of their economic prosperity was shipped overseas and would that kind of white nationalist anger begin to point towards china and if that's the case then there's not a whole lot of hope for us because what we need is rational sober response uh, we need to be pulling all in one direction as the united states and we need to be exercising goodwill so that we're not provoking china um, for instance, right now, China has set up, I forget how many, it's like 12 or 13 uh, islands in the South China Sea. They were just shoals before, which is like a horseshoe sticking out of the ocean. And China made man-made islands out of these shoals, and then they militarized them. And so the United States uh, began to do what we call freedom of navigation operations, where we would send our largest destroyers in between the Philippines and China just to communicate that we see these as free international waters. In the meanwhile, China is trying to communicate, we see this as Chinese sovereign territory and you're not entitled to be here. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about where it's like, do we respond in an aggressive, hostile way? Or do we find a way that we're able to create peace and able to create win-wins to where I don't have to make you small for me to be big and I don't have to belittle myself for you to win. You see what I mean? We're actually finding integrative solutions and compromises that's going to depend on two things. Number one is rational leadership. Uh, and number two is a rational society. Because even wise leaders can get pushed into foolish things if they have 
and then why is society trying to push them in the wrong direction correct i also think i'm trying to like um um because over the course of the time the leaders here in the united states thought the prosper china will become a democratic but it didn't become a democratic but now um talking about finding an integrated ways or or compromise or or, or finding a ways to uh, to sustain the peace how the peace will be sustained when over the course of the time when uh, that was thought behind the head that prosper china will be democratic but it didn't happen so if it didn't happen then then what hope is there that it will happen in the future? <laughs> yeah. you, you said it. <laughs> okay. Um, I will say that from what we've seen, it appears that China is a rational actor. Um, they're not, they're acting in their own best interest. Um, they're acting in their own best financial interest. They're acting in their own best military interest. And this is just me being sober and honest. If I were, on the Chinese side of the equation, uh, I would fear that in order for my country to reach its full potential, we may have to challenge the United States in the future. And so I don't think that we should see everything that they do as a threat. Um, this is something that we call a, a security dilemma in international affairs. It's the idea that both sides are acting defensively, but they perceive the other side to be aggressive. So yeah. old example is the United States and the Soviet Union we prepare so we prepare nuclear weapons in fear that something bad can happen the soviet union does likewise and over time we both think that the other guy is the aggressor and we're both acting defensively in our own best interests and we wind up creating we scale up and escalate an arms race okay. um, so we need to be careful to understand that not everything that china does that may not be in our best interest that may be in theirs. And we need to understand, is there something our country is doing that is provoking that response? And is there something we could do that could take that fear away and let them know that we have a hand of goodwill extended and we desire to be friends and we desire to win together? That's where I'm more scared is the U.S. side is will we escalate the conflict um, in, in that way? That said, I'm not a supporter of, of communism. I, I believe in basic human rights as a Christian. I think that we should have our freedom to, to love and serve God freely. I think we should have the ability to speak against our government and that not be seen as something that uh, warrants a, a silencing response, you know? Um, and so one thing that is really sounding a lot of alarm and creating fear in Washington is that uh, China has been using um, technology to, to try to control their society. And in their minds, it's probably, this is just how we practice the rule of law. We don't want there to be crime. We don't want there to be bad things. But for a country like ours, where we expect to have the right and the freedom to speak against our government, and we expect to have the right and the freedom to advocate whatever religious stance we want to practice, um, we see that as authoritarian on China's side. And now they've begun to export that to some of the countries where they're supporting the leaders. So there may be an authoritarian leader in an African country uh, where China is supporting that leader because they just want access to whatever minerals are in that country. The United yeah. States would say, That's we don't want to support that. such a leader, but China doesn't really have a morality problem with that. And so when we speak against it, that's, that's something that can lead to conflict. And yeah. so we have to decide very precisely what we want to advocate and what we want to tolerate and what we want to confront and what price we're willing to pay. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Greg. That was a very uh, great discussion, conversation. You shed a great light on some of the point of views that um, um, we as a Christian, as a nation, as um, as also uh, believers, you know, because I would love to see more people because, you know, my heart is to win soul and, and reach and preach and teach people. And uh, there is no bigger uh, reward uh, to me then somebody received Jesus Christ as their personal savior. So that's the biggest reward. And that's and that's the bigger biggest miracle as well. And um and that's why why I worry and not worry, but think about some of the uh, think outside of the box, you know, how we can evangelize. But um she said one of the largest church is in uh, I know it's in Seoul, Korea, but also a growing church. So one of the fastest growing church is in China. 
And when I say that, I mean the fastest growing body of Christ, like body of Christ. So the under Protestant, Protestant Christianity increases 10% per year uh, in China right now. Are you serious? 10%? Yes. Whoa. And so I've heard stories of people like by the thousands getting saved in factories and places like that because they're not necessarily free to just have an ongoing church. Most of the churches that are government sanctioned, you have to bow to the Chinese flag or to a picture of Xi Jinping. And so most of the churches are like home groups. And most of the pastors of these home groups live with the understanding that they can be put into prison. Um, and so I, I shared this with you last night. I want to say this now. Um, I think Washington, D.C. has been asking the wrong question. How can we avoid, avoid war? I think the question we need to be asking is how can we uh, show goodwill and create peace? And I shared with you last night that when, when my concept of China is the Chinese Communist Party, China looks scary to me. When my concept of China is the persecuted church, China becomes my brother. <laughs> you see what I mean? It becomes people who we want to support for the sake of the gospel. Um, and there have actually been hundreds of churches in the last few years that have been destroyed uh, under the order of Xi Jinping in China. Um, and that's basically because they fear that uh, religious freedom would lead to an uprising against the government one day. Wow, wow, that is... Wow, that is something. Well, thank you so much, man, uh, for sharing this, Greg. I really appreciate that. And uh, I hope to have you back on and soon uh, so we can talk more about, you know, the truth. And um, my biggest, uh, you know, the question, uh, I think it has been answered. So how we can evangelize China as well. So I think you threw right in there as well. Uh, and also the, the brother. But evangelizing China, it's... Um, it, it's um, it's it's a big big project and mission you know as um like they can block you out of the country you know or they can do whatever but but we can pray uh, that's what i want to say and we can pray and um we didn't do anything you know that caused something like that it's just a simple conversation and what you think what you study what what, what is your observation over the time of being you know you sharing that so i really appreciate that greg and god bless you sir and god bless your family Please stay safe and healthy and have a beautiful night. God bless you, Edna. Thank you. All right. This was uh, Greg with us all the way from Oklahoma with us. And uh, excited um, because God is doing new things in the world. And I believe God is going to continue to do new things in the world so people can, uh, so the body of Christ continue to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ because there is the that is the biggest reward of our life Jesus, in our life is to receive jesus christ as our personal savior and we should focus on that we give glory honor to the name of our lord jesus because there is nothing there is nothing nobody not at all um you know compared to the god not at all but god of heavens and god of earth uh, god of abraham isaac and jacob all things are possible with him. And I want you to believe with me that God is going to do something amazing. So many thousands and millions of people, brand new, going to be born again and going to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So thank you so much, guys, and God bless you. Have a beautiful night. Take care.